Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to uh, our Osama A. Osman talk. Um, Dr. Osama A. Osman will give a talk about leveraging one-tenth scale designs for connected slash automated vehicle research. Dr. Osman is the Assistant Professor of Intelligent Transportation System and Data, and Data Analytics in the Department of Civil and Chemical Engineering and the Mobility Trust Lead in the Center for Urban Informatics and Progress at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Take it away. <laughs> sure. Thank you very much, Julia. I uh, truly appreciate the, the invite. Such a great uh, uh, thing to be with you guys today and talk about uh, what we're doing uh, in our work and how we um, are working or are trying to advance this, this uh, technology, which is the connected and automated vehicle, uh, which I believe, uh, like many uh, others, uh, is going to change the face of transportation. So, um, like you mentioned, Julia, I'm the assistant professor uh, of um, um, transportation engineering or intelligent transportation systems, to be more specific, and data analytics in the civil and chemical de uh, engineering department at University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. I'm also leading the mobility thrust, uh, which is part of the Center for Urban Informatics and Progress. This is a center that is focused on smart city work. So we're developing or improving uh, the city of Chattanooga and a few others that are around to make them smarter uh, through uh, work in transportation, health, and, and others. Uh, I'm the director of Smith's lab, and this is the lab that um, I founded at the university, which is uh, focused on everything that I basically do in intelligent transportation systems, that analytics, mobility, uh, connectivity or connected automated vehicles and so forth. And we use simulation and we use test tracks and we use multiple uh, means and tools to advance the work in, in connected and auto autonomous vehicles. Uh, what uh, I didn't probably mention in the uh, in my bio and uh, maybe Julia just uh, knew about it about it now, uh, just before we joined, uh, that I'm leaving University of Tennessee uh, by the end of this year. I actually did join. Uh, um, a company that is called LIDES. I'm a project manager. I'm going to be uh, acting as a project manager uh, of one of the uh, most important national uh, initiatives that are uh, focusing on developing or advancing uh, uh, connected and automated vehicles uh, research. So uh, this is called Karma. Maybe you've heard of it. You can uh, look it up. Uh, maybe the, weird, the, the, the name... Um, or the word the word would sound familiar to everyone uh we call it karma c-a-r-m-a and that is uh, basically uh, uh some cooperative program that uh, advances mobility research in the nation and uh, um, that has multiple research tracks one of them is on uh, advancing research in um, uh, freight uh, or trucks let us say uh, truck automation and i'm going to be leading that uh, that work uh, so without further ado let us talk about or get delve or uh, dive into the topic today and that is like i said we're trying i'm trying to cover how we um, uh, have been using or trying to use one tenth scale cars the small little cars uh, uh, that maybe many of you know about already uh, for connected and automated vehicles. But let us first talk about or define autonomous vehicles. Maybe you know that, but what are autonomous vehicles? They are cars that are equipped with multiple sensors and those sensors develop some sort of a situational awareness of what is happening around that vehicle. And with the aid of artificial intelligence and some and uh, some algorithms, the vehicle will be able to identify what is the best course of action given a certain situation. So it's more like the car can act on its own without the need for, for a driver or anything or any intervention. Uh, that is basically the ultimate goal of automation or autonomous vehicles. So uh, an autonomous car is a vehicle that is capable of sensing its environment and operating without human involvement, which as I just mentioned. Uh, so 
we may not need that that's the ultimate goal like i said we may not need at all a human passenger to be present in the vehicle but as of now that's actually the case so we still need someone to be st to be there behind the wheel to monitor and take over whenever needed but again the ultimate goal is to take that completely out of the equation and have this vehicle act on its own without any need for any intervention so uh, a car can basically go anywhere an autonomous car anywhere that any car can go uh, um, um, without the, basically with uh, when there is a, a human driver uh, behind so take that out the car will still be able to go anywhere without any any problem so how they work is basically um, um, th there are multiple things or multiple building blocks that enable the work of this vehicle or these cars but uh, i'm focusing on these three which basically uh, are the core let us say uh, uh, core elements or core core building blocks that enable automation on uh, on our cars or the future cars foreseen future cars so first of all the sensing the sensing capabilities or we can call it perception so those are the sensors that can be cameras can be lidars can be uh, radars can be whatever uh, uh, th that enable uh, the car or provide the, the car with an ability to collect you know feeds about what's happening around it sense what is hap happening around it per perceive what is ha happening around that that vehicle using that sensing capability or the sensors capabilities the car can use some intelligence uh which is artificial intelligence enabled by machine learning and artificial intelligence which everyone is talking about nowadays uh and i've been talking about it for a few years actually and we'll be talking about it for the next uh, uh year like uh, decades and um, a few decades uh using artificial intelligence with this data that is coming from uh, through the sensors the car, like we said, can be can identify that there is maybe someone ahead of me, some car ahead of me, and then will decide that it will, it will need to change lanes or maybe speed up or maybe slow down, maybe stop completely, depending on what is happening around it. So so that that's that's what intelligence enables. The problem is, I wouldn't call a problem, so call it a problem, but basically, uh, uh, since AI or artificial intelligence um use data mostly historical data to uh, uh, train uh, the algorithms uh, to train the vehicle to react so maybe we've seen i see some multiple situations when there is a car ahead of me okay and We've, we've been able to identify that the best course of action in those situations is to maybe change lanes or or maybe stop completely. So the AI is pre-programmed. The algorithms are pre-programmed to act in that way. But maybe there will be some situations that the, the car never seen before. What the car can do is basically, uh, or what the algorithms can do in this, in this case, is to learn these situations. Uh, to learn learn from these new experiences and improve the way uh, uh, the vehicle acts in, in, in those situations. So maybe previously or based on the historical data, the car will, will stop completely when there is a car ahead of it. But when it learns more and more and more as it drives on the road, it will say, okay, I don't have to stop this time. Let me just change lanes and speed up and pass that car ahead of me. So these are the three main components. Like I said, senses, and uses algorithms to act in an intelligent way and also tries to learn from the different situations, the new situations, the new data that it collects, that it sees to be able to act or improve the way it operates uh, in uh, the environment or on the roads. So this is basically how these cars uh, um, work. Uh, there are six levels of automation, actually. Um, uh, like I said, the ultimate goal, I've said that that uh, uh, phrase multiple times, Multi uh, the ultimate goal is to take the driver completely out of the equation, but this is not going to happen uh, in a blink of an eye. It takes time. It is taken time already, and we're going through that. that that's uh, uh, like the different phases uh, to reach that ultimate goal, which is here, level five automation. We don't need the driver anymore. But we're coming through uh, level zero, which is which means no automation. These are the cars, some of the cars that we have nowadays. Uh, and the, the, all of the cars that we had, let us say, uh, 10 years ago and maybe more, uh, all of them were all uh, level zero automation. 
But then we have level one, which could be just uh, a cruise control. Uh, the car can uh, fix the speed or can uh, adjust the speed. Then the, the level two uh, uh, automation, which is basically steering with uh, speeding. Then we go to level three, which is a higher higher level of automation uh, in, in which you know the car can do most or, uh, of the driving tasks without, without any intervention for the hum- from the human. And uh, uh, but there will be a need sometimes for humans to override or take over in some uh, situations. Level four is a higher level of automation where the car can perform all of the tasks without any intervention. However, there might be some situations where the human intervention or the person, the driver taking over could be uh, still uh, needed. Where we are now, we have many cars on the roads that are level one or level two. Level three is is not yet there. Maybe we have uh, probably Honda, uh, developed one uh, car that's um, uh, only in Japan so far, and Mercedes they have also uh, a level three car that is you know uh, uh, produced and is available in Germany. Uh, but uh, the rest of the world, most of the uh, car manufacturers are not there yet. Maybe like in the research and development stages and and so forth, but not in the production. Uh, uh, or they're not producing, mass producing these cars uh, yet. So the what's being mass produced is, like I said, level one and, and level two uh, so far. But research is ongoing on level three, four, and, uh, and five. So that is for automation. And uh, like I said, it's basically a car that has its own sensors, doesn't rely on any um, um, uh, interaction with any external sources, and uses these sensors to detect and, and you know, uh, uh, identify what's happening around it and based on that uh, reacts or acts accordingly. But what is connectivity or what is connected vehicles? When I started um, the first like the first slide, I said it's connected automated vehicle. What we've talked about all so far is just automation. Connected cars are the cars that have wireless communication capability. Many cars nowadays do have that. So that's basically the car is able to wirelessly communicate with each other talk with each other, exchange information. What information may be like, I'm slowing down now, or I'm about to slow down. You need to pay attention, okay? We'll send that message uh, through uh, through the wireless communication to the traffic around me so they can act accordingly. And by acting accordingly, I mean the drivers will receive the message and they, the drivers will act accordingly. We're not talking automation here. Okay, uh, but the car also can communicate with infrastructure, and that the infrastructure could be the traffic signal, for instance. So the traffic signal would communicate with a car that is approaching the intersection. That um, I'm about to turn red. You need to slow down so that you can, you know, uh, improve the way you're operating. Improve maybe fuel consumption. You don't uh, uh, consume so much fuel by, you know, speeding up and then having to stop, uh, make a hard stop at the intersection and so forth. All right. Uh, so by communicating that information, the car can improve, you know, the way it's operating as it approaches the uh, the intersection. Also, the car could uh, could send information to the traffic signal that I'm approaching. Please give me uh, some extension, green extension, for instance. So the signal would get that information, increase the green time a little bit so that car can pass. But in this case, case it's not just going to be like a, a, a regular car, a privately owned car. It could be like a bus. So basically a high, high occupancy vehicle where priority here is needed because we're serving multiple people on one on one car. So in this case, maybe the signal can provide priority to uh, improve the operability of the entire uh, system. So that's how connectivity or con- uh, communications work or what uh, uh, connectivity connected vehicles uh, are. Through these capabilities, communication capabilities, like I said, vehicle can communicate with the infrastructure, can communicate with each other, can communicate with the cloud, can communicate with the pedestrian that is about to cross the road, and uh, maybe you'll tell the pedestrian that I'm, I'm approaching, or maybe the pedestrian will tell the car that I'm about to cross. So there is some sort of a self-awareness happening here. Uh, uh, so both parties can act accordingly. And the uh, regular term that we use here is V to X or vehicle to everything. The vehicle can communicate with everything around it and um, 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 improve um, or exchange information through this wireless uh, communication. 
So we talked about now the automation. We talked about the connectivity. What is connected on automated vehicles is both. So we're combining both together. So the car has all of these sensors, all right, that uh, that can, um, you know, um, um, sense what is happening ar around it. But also the car can communicate with the other cars through wireless communications, to communicate with the infrastructure through wireless communication. So it's not just the car is automated and can control itself and can, can, uh, uh, can sense by itself, but also receive some aid from the, uh, through the wireless communication, uh, like I said, by combining these two uh, components. So um, why is this really so important? Why is it uh, 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 that critical uh, that that everybody is, is is working on developing these technologies connected in autonomous vehicles. What benefit are we gaining from 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 these technologies? Let me show this example or this video, uh, and that's that's a video of a crash. Uh, it's not really a hard one or a or a tough one, so I'm going to kind of speed it up a little bit. You see, this car right here is waiting. Uh, the small one, the small little one. This one is waiting to make a, tur a, a turn left here once the traffic goes through or the through traffic clears a little bit. See what happens now. When it starts to cross, the other car hits it badly. All right. Um, so imagine that in this situation that uh, uh, these two cars um, can communicate with each other. Well, let me ask this question first. Why do you think these cars hit each other? Basically, the, the simplest and the fastest answer would be they can't see each other. Yes, they can't see each other. And that's that's the main reason why. Uh, but there are some other reasons, which is basically uh, drivers being reckless, you know, and, and so on and so forth. But the main reason, they cannot see each other. But what if this through this pole that you see right here at the top, maybe there is some sort of a camera that is monitoring the entire intersection. And through this, this monitoring, the car, the, the camera can, uh, and, and with like, uh, let us say, some uh, uh, AI capability, artificial intelligence that could be uh, uh, attached to that camera through the edge, the, the, there will be some identification or some uh, alert that uh, uh, warning that um, um, these cars are about are going to collide or these cars don't see each other or maybe there is a vehicle that is approaching which is the black one that is coming th was coming through here is approaching with a fast speed or the high speed so that message can be communicated with, to everyone in the intersection if both of all vehicles have this wireless communication capability so with that communication the cars will be ready the drivers will be ready the drivers know that something is happening and the drivers know that that is not it may not be that safe especially this one to turn left now all right so let me wait a little bit and, and until that's this warning is completely uh, cleared so that's connectivity all right but what is the role of automation here the role of automation is is actually uh, 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 critical look at how when this uh, uh, crash happened all right at the signal here the signal was red all right and then this started turning and the signal turned green so basically when this guy started uh, uh, turning his signal had already turned red and this guy decided to just speed up and uh, try to you know uh, uh, cross the intersection before the signal turned red but that was really uh, too late and this is why we saw this crash so it's not, it's not just a matter of them not being able to see each other they all they also both uh, broke the law here uh, and and uh, broke the uh, the red light all right so if we have automation this will never happen if we have communi communication this would never happen so take the driver these two these two drivers completely out of the equation here and you will see a better behavior uh, for these for these vehicles so so uh, and that's one one single situation where connectivity and automation uh, could really could have helped uh, significantly uh, actually but uh, the, the we can improve uh, uh, you know um, I'm trying to get out of this. I may need to. Um, sorry. Yep. So uh, um, uh, through, like I said, we can improve. Uh, or we can have multiple other benefits in addition to improving safety uh, in a situation like the one 
uh, we saw. And this is why these technologies are being are being developed. However, we are still facing some challenges. Um, maybe you've seen uh, the news the past few years, and uh, you know, uh, let me talk about this one very quickly. This one was an Uber driver in Arizona, and Uber in the Arizona they are using automation, level two automation. Uh, so basically, the cars, uh, you know, can um, um, be um, turned on, like the autopilot can be turned on, and the cars can be driving uh, on their own just steering and and um, and uh, uh, speed control all right so this this driver right here uh, did um, uh, turn on the autopilot and the car was going through the road uh, unfortunately there was a biker or a pedestrian with a bike as you see here crossing in front of the car the car didn't see properly and unfortunately an accident happened in in this in this situation so um what i wanted to say here or what i want to say here is that even though we are developing the technology even though we have them on the roads we're still in need to have the drivers ready to take over in situations like like these ones we're not that far into automation yet we're not we didn't get to level five yet and this is what i said a, a couple of slides back and this is why research and development is still going on to reach that level five when uh, uh, we, want, we may not need at all to have uh, a driver. So how this research and development effort is going on? There are multiple tools to use or, or people are using nowadays to improve or to develop these technologies. The first one is just simulation, computer simulation, which is this one right here. Um, <clears throat> basically, we uh, try to emulate what is happening on the, uh, on the transportation uh, system we we'll try to emulate how a connected and automated car could act uh, using if the if it has those sensors that uh, that uh, we just uh, talked about. Uh, so uh, uh, how the car would act, how the car would drive, how the car, the car would plan uh, and, and 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 you know uh, learn and so forth. This is all done in computer. Uh, simulation. Many big companies are using those, relying on those. Many, uh, most of the researchers, if not all, uh, in all uh, the the uh, uh, universities, they are using computer simulation for that uh, purpose. The only issue is that we are not really uh, reflecting accurately, hundred percent accurately, how an actual car could behave. So that's the only uh, drawback. The, the, only, the only drawback. The only the other things that were not hundred uh, percent uh, accurately reflecting how the entire system, the entire traffic, all of the cars on the roads are behaving. So, and that's another thing. So we're assuming there are many assumptions happening in these in these tools, uh, the uh, the computer simulation tools. Maybe uh, some of them is is like we're assuming some ideal behavior, like all of the vehicles. Most the majority of the vehicles are behaving in somewhat the same way, which is not the case on uh, the real uh, the real world in the real world. Uh, this is why um, uh, there was a shift or there is uh, the other tool that people use is driving simulators where we actually plug in an actual driver into uh, uh, the loop, into the simulation loop. It's still simulation, uh, still uh, computer simulation, but there is an actual driver behind the wheel that could improve uh, the accuracy of emulating how the traffic is behaving since we are actually having a driver uh, uh, doing that or performing uh, that task. That's great. This is good. But how, uh, but the, the problem still is that uh, we're having one driver, not multiple drivers, not hundreds of drivers like we see in the in the real world. So we're reflecting, we're emulating, accurately, accurately emulating the behavior of only one uh, driver. Yes, the solution for that is to have a network simulation. Maybe we can have multiple simulators connect with each other, but still how many can we get? A hundred, a thousand, two thousand may not be possible, right? And this is why the uh, uh, um, the best way to test these technologies and make sure they're ready is to use test tracks and actual cars. And of course, it would be much better if we get those actual cars after they are, test, after they are tested on the test tracks to be tested in the in the real world drive on the on the real uh, real road the issue is that even though it's the best way to go the issue is that they are uh, very expensive uh, not only financially or money wise 
they could be expensive if there if a crash happened. So if a crash happens, that could mean some catastrophe in, in this case. This is why uh, there was a direction to use the smaller size cars, right? Uh, which can have those actual sensors uh, that um, an actual car uh, would have, but at a smaller scale, so we can test them in, in a better uh, way, in a controlled way, without any, any uh, risks, without any high uh, costs uh, uh, whatsoever. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the in the rest of this uh, of this uh, uh, lecture, so uh, or this talk. So basically, F one tenth autonomous cars is a project that was uh, uh, developed or originated uh, or founded by the University of Pennsylvania about five years ago, uh, and the, the the main goal of it is is to is to foster uh, interest and excitement and uh, and critical thinking about the uh, field of autonomous autonomous systems so uh, they uh, they were like uh, using or um, um, their mission was you know focusing on building their cars or building the cars trying to identify the best way to build those autonomous cars so that was one focus uh, what sensors do we need what um, platforms do we need what kind of cars do we need what kind of power do we need what and so on and so forth that was a, one of the main focuses so basically how to build those cars such that they can act uh, like as close as to uh, the actual uh, cars of course there is a learning uh, uh, objective or, or, or a pillar or goal here uh, through the bills through the algorithmic development through uh, uh, how to use or how to um, enable robotics and so forth and uh, of course there was some racing and that's the fun part of f110 if you visit their website which i have here on this slide uh, if you visit their website, you'll see really uh, the competitions they have. They race with each other with, the, with those cars after they develop them. Uh, develop them and uh, that is uh, a, a huge fun part in this, in this work. And of course, the ultimate goal is to research and improve and, and reach, um, um, you know, uh, new ends uh, where we can, you know, like we're doing now, uh, many people are doing nowadays, research uh, or develop connected and autonomous cars, which is, you know, something that is huge uh, and, and promising to change the way we travel uh, uh, using those tiny, small, little, uh, little cars. So, <clears throat> again, the goals of, of this project or of this uh, F-110, the smaller size toy cars, like I sometimes like to call them, uh, the goal is to get a hands-on introduction to the challenges and joys of building an autonomous robot and to get to apply and test the limits of the available uh, solutions, which are, you know, most some of the or uh, most of the autonomous cars rely on. So basically get those algorithms, plug them in, in those cars and see how they behave and maybe improve them, maybe change them and so on. Uh, this is done uh, by following through uh, the steps of building a fast autonomous, uh, an autonomous race car. So again, the ultimate goal that or not really the ultimate goal, they are building their cars, improving their cars through a series of competitions where they, they, they at the end race with, with each other and, and, and uh, you know, they have um, fun prizes and the, they have lots of fun. So they are using this to uh, uh, encourage uh, students and encourage people to improve the development of these of these cars. Um, so, what is involved in this car? In these cars? <laughs> so, uh, building an autonomous car, like maybe like in, in one of the slides, I mentioned sensing, I mentioned intelligence, mentioned learning. Uh, I can actually, uh, or these can actually be uh, changed a little bit to say. That, uh, that an autonomous car requires an understanding or relies on uh, perception, planning, and control. An autonomous car to operate, to move, needs these three main elements, with these three main components. Perception, which is basically through, uh, you know, um, the sensors that, that they have. Planning, which is through the AI, the algorithms that they are uh, 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 installed or they, that they have on their on their systems and control and basically uh, using the uh, output from the planning uh, part or the the algorithms 
uh, this is reflected into control tasks that the car takes as orders and moves based uh, based upon. So uh, through building one tenth cars, students usually always not usually learn about and use basic and more advanced sensors to provide the car with raw data about where it is and where it's going in the real world and and th this is happening to using multiple sensors i'm not gonna get to mention any of these now i'll talk about them in a second but using them again this there is that perception part so perception algorithms that process the raw sensor data uh, and that includes object detection, obje object tracking. So detecting that there is a car ahead of me, detecting that there is a pedestrian ahead of me and track those to identify the best course of action, like I said, or I've been saying. And of course, once the perception is done, there is the motion planning, change lane, speed up, slow down and so forth. And that requires mapping the road, entire uh, the entire road around that vehicle. And that sometimes requires uh, HD maps, maybe not on this smaller scale, but requires some mapping in a way. And of course, using all these things, the low level control is done and the whole thing is built on the robotics operating uh, system. <clears throat> so um, uh, we used this uh, initiative, we used these products uh, and they have their own designs uh, um, in terms of the build, what sensors they were using, how many platforms they use it, they're using. Uh, they don't usually tap into or heavily tap into the connected autonomous parts. And this is why uh, we needed to tweak that a little bit to serve our, our purpose. Uh, what I'm going to talk about now is basically how we built the hardware very briefly and what are the elements that we used to build our hardware and uh, what we're currently doing or uh, 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 that the team is doing is basically we're uh, trying to uh, uh, install some automation software and, and improve that software, improve on that software to see how can the research be done or how this technology can be improved using these three, uh, these uh, tiny uh, little cars. So in, in, in F110 cars, they usually uh, use one platform, and we'll see in a, in a, in a second what I mean by that platform. Uh, but we tweak that to uh, have uh, two platforms to be able to install more sensors uh, for the, to, that, that can serve our, uh, our purpose. And of course, it was very important to make sure that everything is compatible with each, uh, with each other. So uh, to start the build, we needed this RC cars. All of us know these and play with them sometimes, uh, um, but they are actually ready for uh, things like that, that to, can, to, to be tweaked for things like that. And they can actually go sometimes to speeds of up to uh, 60 or 70 miles per hour. <coughs> that could be really crazy. So these are really uh, great cars that can serve the purpose here. So um, if, if we look under the hood of, of, of these cars, they have um, uh, three main components. They have the motors, uh, one for steering, one for um, um, uh, speeding and, and so forth. And they have their, uh, their, their batteries that uh, uh, enable the, that entire work. You will see multiple things here, but I'm not going to get to those details. These are the three main things we needed to look at. It was important that, to note that, uh, uh, that the, the motors that come on these cars can't, uh, usually can't be used easily for, uh, for uh, the purpose of, of our work. Uh, which is, you know, we needed a car that can change speeds, that can be controlled speed-wise and steering-wise. So uh, um, for that, the motor needed to be uh, changed, and that's what what we uh, what we did. We usually use those brushless mo DC motors, and that's uh, some cars have them, some cars may not have uh, those uh, those motors. <clears throat> And this is basically uh, what controls the, the steering, and this is the main battery uh, pack, and it's actually 
uh, need needs needs to be dealt with uh, carefully. Probably since I've seen I've seen your uh, web page and I've seen that you guys did build uh, some uh, robots. So you probably you already know about these these things. But again, uh, these batteries need to be handled uh, carefully because especially after one one run or so. Um, after every run, it could re get really really hot and it could cause uh, major issues <coughs> that's basically how the whole thing is connected and that <coughs> takes us <coughs> to the three main uh, components uh, that i just mentioned in the in the beginning of of this part uh when i started the f 110th part uh, so we have the perception we needed to make sure we have all this the components that are needed for the perception lidar camera imu uh, and, and 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 so forth and then we have the planning that that means taking this data coming from these sensors to filter them to process them generate some maps develop some sort of computer vision to identify what's happening track what's uh, track the different objects and detect the, the different objects around the car localize the car and identify exactly where this car is located relative to everything that is around it um and based on that, perform some sort of path planning, uh, which is, like I said, speed up, slow down, change lanes, steer here, steer there, and so on and so forth. And these, uh, 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 after the planning is done, this all is feeds into the control part that takes those as input and produces them as actual control output through steering and speeding and acceleration. <clears throat> so for the perception part, <clears throat> four main sensors we needed to install. Uh, uh, a Z-depth camera, a LiDAR, an IMU, which is inertial measurement unit, and a GPS. Okay. The, the stereo camera is basically a camera that, as you see, can have like two uh, eyes, if that's the right word to use here. But basically, it, act, it makes it act more like an actual uh, human eye. So it develops this depth perception of everything that is uh, that is seen through these cars, and they have about 120 degree uh, a wide angle field of view, which is uh, as close as possible to how uh, an actual human eye uh, uh, perceives and sees things. And through that, uh, there is some sort of spatial object detection, which is basically the depth perception of the different objects around the the the, the this camera sees and this also enables uh, an accurate positional tracking of the different objects and of course that helps you know uh, in a way to identify the actual position or to help with the actual positioning the localization of the car uh, itself so after that uh, element is is there and we've, 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 we've like I, um, got it and kind of install it we we needed to uh, have this uh, beautiful uh, tiny uh, uh, component uh, critical component that helps a lot also with uh, the detection which helps a lot with the localization mainly and that is the lidar uh, and this is um, um, it has about like 30 meters detection range. So compare that to the camera. This actually can uh, um, help with help better plan ahead, further ahead uh, for the car. So instead of just planning an actual like a, an immediate maneuver for the car, which can happen through uh, through the camera uh, with the lidar, that can help uh, provide some sort of a longer uh, uh, term planning. And by longer term, I don't mean like days ahead, but maybe. A few more seconds ahead or maybe minutes ahead <coughs> and then we have the imu uh, so the camera sees what's around the lidar helps sees further uh, beyond and not only ahead all, also around so again that's maybe uh, one of the main other differences between the lidar and the camera the camera sees 120 degrees ahead of it uh, but the lidar sees 360 around the, the entire uh, car the imu basically is uh, is the most important piece in the the, the car uh, an autonomous car needs because it helps the uh, the car identify the the actual accurately identify the actual positioning of this car the actual heading of the car the actual rotation 
direction of this car relative to everything around it and relative to the earth the axis the actual axis of earth and that's through this magnetometers uh, and based on that whatever action uh, is planned is, is is going to be planned ac accurately so maybe the car is tilted a little bit on the on the road it's not completely centered and doesn't it doesn't have a zero angle with the center line of the of the uh, uh, of the road okay so if we don't detect that there's not that angle is not is not zero maybe it's five degrees the car will get will depart the lane later like uh, as it moves uh, ahead but with the, the help of the imu it, it, the, the, we will be able to identify that there is some deviation there is some hitting between uh that the, the car has so the car instead of just moving forward it will steer a little bit to adjust its positioning and move straight along the center line of the of that lane so this is really i i consider it the most important piece the most important sensor that this car or autonomous cars would uh, would need and of course the gps and this helps with localizing the car and identifying where the car is exactly uh, uh relative to you know uh, um, um actual reference points okay uh you see this this is actually it's like a very tiny piece like this but it has the ability to, to communicate with uh, up to 22 satellites through 66 channels. It's really an amazing piece that helps with identifying the actual positioning of, of the car. So once we have those or through these four sensors, a camera, it sees everything ahead of it, like 120 degrees. Uh, it has this depth perception capability, all right, just like the human eye. So it's more like a driver, an actual driver. And we have the LiDAR that's seeing everything around the car. We have the IMU that's identifying how the car is positioning, rotated, tilted, and so forth. And the GPS that gives you the, your reference point in your, uh, in your network or in the network or in the, on the map. So you have that reference point through this, this uh, GPS, the IMU rotations, and so forth, the camera, that driver eyes, the, the depth perception part, and the LiDAR, what is around me completely like 360. Based on this, we're developing a complete uh, um, situation and awareness of where am I, how am I positioned, what is around me in every direction, how far all these things are from my uh, position, and based on that, I can plan my uh, I mean, as a car, plan my movements, plan my maneuvers, and start to move uh, to move ahead. So this is basically these are uh, the main uh, components that enable the perception, like I I mentioned. Well, through the perception, we got these feeds from all of these sensors. Let us now do the planning, and that planning is done through this uh, computer, the small little tiny computer that is installed. Uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, yes, installed on the car. And here we use those Jetson GPU uh, computers, and uh, uh, they, have, they are very powerful, powerful. They take all of the input coming from these four sensors, and they do all of these tasks, like I mentioned in the beginning, filtering, mapping, uh, uh, vis computer vision, detection, tracking, localization, and then, of course, based on that, do, does path uh, planning. <clears throat> Uh, and then once these uh, all all these uh, these things are, are are happening, so we got the sensing parts, we got the control, the planning part. Let us uh, translate that into control, control in terms of speeding, control in terms of um, uh, 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 steering, and that is happening through uh, this uh, controller. We call it the VESC control, the uh, the Vedder uh, electronic speed controller. It, uh, it has uh, multiple phases and it, 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 it's really, it acts more like an actual car, speeding up, speeding down smoothly and so on and so forth. Same thing for the steering. And this is all happening through that little tiny uh, piece of, of, um, uh, of sensor, of, of controller, if you will. <coughs> okay. But how this is, this the whole thing is powered definitely it requires some, uh, a very well designed power board and this is uh, usually is is, is uh, not easy to obtain but it can be can be designed and their designs are out there um, uh, they can be uh, produced easily uh, and this regulates the power that is coming through the sensor actually going through the sensors coming through to the uh, uh, um, 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 computing unit the, the the GPU and also same thing uh, going through to the uh, controllers to 
you know make the whole unit or the the whole car act as one unit instead of multiple uh, you know sensors and uh, and pieces of uh, of equipment that may not have any relationship with each other it's all connected together through uh, that and, and regulated through that that power uh, power board so uh, how we we did the the build we definitely these are the main components like i mentioned there are a few other elements like a usb hub like connectors and here and there but basically we got the car we had to uh, disassemble it take off some of the components <clears throat> uh and and replace them with the ones we needed like the brushless motor for instance uh the batteries we didn't need the the battery that that the car usually have we need like specific type of battery to uh, that have longer uh, uh you know uh, run times and then we needed to identify what kind of platform can we install on top of this car to install the uh, the different sensors uh, the current designs that are out there didn't help us much, so we had to design our own platform. If you uh, see here, you will look here, have a closer look. This is basically the black platform up there, up here, is the one that is uh, uh, usually available on the F110, but we had to design that gray one that is below it uh, to be able to make this fit uh, our, uh, our car. Our original plan was to have this on one platform and install all the all of the sensors on top of it, but we realized that this is not going to help us, and this is why, <clears throat> or this is when we added another level for another platform. If I go back here, another platform. So this is the uh, original platform, and we have another one on top of it, and you see the standoffs between the two. So we have some some sensors, some U like USB hubs, some connectors on the lower platform, and we have here the LiDAR, you see it, you see here the GPU, you see here the VISC control, the, con the speed controller, and, and, and so forth. And you will see the camera, <clears throat> that is the camera actually installed right here. <clears throat> they are on the, on the upper uh, uh, platform or the upper deck. <clears throat> He, this is basically how uh, the whole thing is is was getting to look like as we uh, added the connections and as we we uh, put everything on top of the, uh, the the car chassis and this was basically the uh, final product in terms of hardware uh, of course the software is another milestone that we are uh, approaching to hit like uh, we're, we're starting to install the different software that is needed to enable automation on these cars uh, to enable research on these cars and and uh, but we're very proud of of uh, the final product that that we have here is like like you can see this is a very tiny car uh, uh, next to the door that uh, the, 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 it's, it's really something that you can play with if that's really uh, <clears throat> the right word to use in a lab, in an, in an actual lab or an actual room, uh, have tracks for it, maybe have a, tra a small tiny traffic signal for it that you can even operate uh, through some sort of a, a small uh, controller <clears throat> that, that we can develop or you can develop, right? and uh, establish some sort of communication between this car uh, and, and that traffic signal. And that's actually a next step that we're going to work on. We're going to add uh, a router to enable this uh, communications through Wi-Fi between the car and, uh, and uh, infrastructure or uh, maybe edge or so forth. This all can be done in a closed room no need to interact with actual traffic and no need to uh, uh, worry about damaging things. Uh, um, um, and you can do the research uh, that you want, uh, that, like just like anyone who is working with, with actual uh, cars, because they basically you have very similar sensors to what an actual car have. Maybe the actual car have like uh, more than that especially if we're talking about large scale cars, the trucks may have multiple LIDARs, multiple GPSs, multiple uh, of everything, right? Uh, but still that kind of replicates what is happening on those actual cars. And you can see everything in action right in front of you uh, in a small, like I said, in a closed uh, uh, room. So uh, this is our product. This is our car. This is the F110. As you see, there are many differences 
in terms of uh, uh, first of all the platform this has one we have two uh, we have two levels this one has one the camera is different and uh, many other things are different like they, they didn't have a GPS we added a GPS uh, so uh, um, uh, like I said we had to tweak the design uh, to help serve uh, our our purpose and that's what we did and uh, there is uh, so much excitement about the next steps and i really believe that this is a great project that uh, uh, everyone here can work on you can work on together you can develop these cars together the learning material is out there i can share whatever uh, 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 like all the, th the resources that you guys need um, uh, again they are available on the on their website but like because we tweaked it a little bit, we may have some th some uh, stuff that that could be a little bit different. This can be shared, no no issue with that. And again, it's a great project that uh, uh, you will have fun working on, and uh, you will have fun learning a lot from for your uh, for your career uh, later on. Um, so this concludes my uh, presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions or any comments or. Uh, um, uh, but yeah, uh, this is uh, all I have, and uh, I'll be happy to address or answer any of your questions. All right. Thank you so much, Professor. This was very educational, and it's a good resource. Um, and we also have a few questions here. So the first one is, um, does a new event only have to happen once for an autonomous vehicle to learn? How long does it have to take? To learn autonomous vehicles? Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, there are multiple resources out there. Of course, you need to take them uh, step by step. I believe this uh, this little project here is is going to be a, a, a critical, a crucial first step uh, um, to begin with. So basically, you will learn the hardware because that's really a very important step. What is the hardware? What is involved? How the whole thing works? And you can use uh, a small car like this to learn all of that. Once you've you've nailed it with the hardware, you can start to dig. Uh, deeper in the software and of course that requires knowledge of uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, but like um, it, it's something while could sound might sound a little bit complicated it's really not and everyone can learn AI and the resources are out there on, on uh, either on YouTube or Coursera and even the Karma platform that I'm that I was talking about in the in the end that this is actually my email uh, that I'm going to be using later <clears throat> for that work the Karma platform they have open source software for automation that can everyone can basically download and, and install on these cars and learn from how to, how can we uh, improve this software how can we improve automation by learning that that software multiple resources are out there on the karma platform just the karma platform the multiple resources that are, are, are there the the software is open source you can guys download it you can learn from it but again like i said this car is really a first important uh, step. How long would that would that take? It depends on the dedication. So, how much time are you going to uh, assign to learn this this stuff? It could be a few months. It could be a few years. It could be <clears throat> maybe two three months to to master this this whole thing, depending on how much time you want to assign for for this. But it doesn't require honestly it doesn't require a degree. As long as you know a little bit of programming, you know. Uh, uh understand the hardware it doesn't take that 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 long to to learn this stuff okay interesting okay um the next question is how could a connected vehicle communicate to a ped pedestrian in a new way so the the connected vehicles usually communicate to the pedestrians through uh, uh cellular all right so um uh, maybe the um the original plans that that um, uh, were there for connected cars is to use dedicated short range communication. I don't want to get into the details of, of this thing, but basically uh, the new direction is to use cellular tower, cellular communications to communicate with everything. So a car would be approaching an intersection, for instance, disseminates a message, okay, programmatically to uh so the driver really doesn't have to interact or maybe see, like send a message or hit a button or anything it's programmatically uh <clears throat> the whole thing is is communicated to the infrastructure and maybe through some camera that is installed like i mentioned uh at the intersection it will detect that there is a car approaching and this will be disseminated back to uh the driver based on some sort of geofencing 
okay it will identify that these this car and that pedestrian are within like in the vicinity of each other and there is the potential uh, conflict between them so the message is disseminated back to the uh, uh, the pedestrian through a phone app and there are multiple phone apps nowadays that are that have used these these um, uh, capabilities of course the infrastructure may not be ready yet for them but uh, uh, there is uh, for instance uh, applied ai uh, is is one app they they have their own app uh, i can't really f uh, uh, remember the name of it but i can uh, you know uh, send it to you julia later uh, they have their own app that that have these capabilities but of course they have to be enabled depending on the area and depending on the available uh, infrastructure so this is basically how this is this communication is is happening did I address the question? Yes. Um, yeah, okay. So the next question is, are connected and automated vehicles going to be taught differently in areas with different climate and, we and weather patterns? Uh, of course. So, uh, and that's the learning part. So, mm -hmm. like I said, there is the sensing and there is the intelligence and those we can definitely take care of them uh, easily if we have data, if we, if we have... Uh, uh, good amount of, of, of um, you know, historical data, <clears throat> okay? We can identify that the car has to do this in this situation, in this environment, in this weather, and so forth, all right? However, uh, um, maybe in a different, you know, uh, terrain, for instance, uh, different uh, uh, roadway setup, the car may, may need to learn that, that new setup and act based on that. So to need to get this data, and improve uh, its learning automatically, programmatically, and of course the intelligence will be more like adjusted. So the intelligence and, and learning part are kind of go hand in hand. The learning improves that intelligence, keeps on into improving that intelligence. Um, of course, the weather conditions would affect how some of the sensors uh, would behave, right? So for instance, LiDAR, <clears throat> may not be may not be working well if it's like raining heavily or maybe if uh, uh, there are some you know specific uh, climate conditions or, 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 or uh, weather conditions may not work properly the camera maybe uh, if there is a fog they may not see really properly just like the human eye so in these situations uh, we uh, the, the car should be able to more like adjust and 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 shift it's uh, it's uh, it's reliance from maybe the lidar no because of the weather condition i'm not going to rely on the input from the lidar let me shift and use the gps for now and so forth right for the localization part specifically so uh, definitely weather conditions uh, have a great uh, impact on how the car works and, uh, and and the car needs to be able to prioritize on what input to use and how it should act and how it should learn in new uh, new conditions all right Great, interesting. Okay, so the next question is, can you elaborate more on the kinds of races F110 has? So um, I may not have all of the details on that, but basically it's, uh, it's more like the, the cars should race with each other to reach certain points. The, uh, the cars should, uh, uh, should race with each other. The teams should compete with each other to make the car perform certain tasks, all right? If you really visit the website, uh, their website that I had on the, on the first, uh, uh, slide in the iPhone tenth, which is right here. You will see uh, the the fun they have. Uh, like I said, it could be multiple, like performing certain tasks, could be actual racing with each other. And you probably heard, and that's not F one tenth, but you probably heard of uh, <clears throat> this um, actual uh, uh, you call it competitive driving automation. It was a huge competition uh, between uh, multiple teams from around the world to make the cars race autonomously with each other on, te on, on actual racing tracks. Uh, so the concept that uh, we have now is to have the cars cooperate with each other, but that was a new concept or the new, a new uh, thing that was introduced to make them compete with each, with each other instead of, of cooperate with each other. But again, back to your question, uh, what kind of races, again, could be uh, performing certain tasks, could be actual races, and to get more details, basically visit this website and you will see everything about F110. And they actually have multiple resources uh, about the build, about the different uh, uh, sensors that you need, the different components that you need, how to build them with each other. They have some, they may not have videos for that, but they have some uh, reading material on, on what, uh, what needs to be done to put the different uh, sensors uh, together. But you can also go to YouTube and you will find some resources on how to, to build the car. 
for our car we we build it a little bit differently and this is something that we can share without any any issue all right wow we should really check out that website sometime yeah. Um, okay, the next question is, how does a four-wheel impact steering, wait, how does a four, yeah, impact steering when compared with the two-wheel drive? So that's a, that's a question for a mechanical engineer. I may not have a clear answer to that, but uh, a four-wheeler for me as a, as a regular person, like I would put myself now uh, as a regular person, something that would make the car uh, actually uh, more powerful, whether it, it would affect the steering differently, would affect the steering, basically it would not uh, be, uh, may not be as, uh, uh, as easy task to perform as uh, if it's just, uh, 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 if it's not four-wheeler, but it, again, uh, I don't want to say something that may, may not be correct. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's something that I myself would, would need to look up. Uh, I'm not a mechanical engineer, but again, if there is a mechanical engineer, maybe you can ask the question and they would address it uh, more properly. All right, great. Um, yeah, next, the last question is, how do you use IMU effectively slash accurately without any interference, despite there being lots of metal in close proximity? Uh, all right. So that that's 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 one of the issues that that uh, like I mentioned that the, that these cars or um, uh, generally have. <clears throat> so in when there is uh, uh, like line of sight issues, weather conditions, and so forth, uh, th these sensors may be impacted a little bit. Of course, since IMU relies some relies on the. Uh, uh, um, on the magnetic fields in a way to, to be able to identify the actual positioning, having metals around you may not be, uh, um, may not help much or may kind of interfere with you. And this is why you need input from multiple sensors, right? It's not only the IMU. If it was just the IMU, I would say, no, we, we're, we're kind of stuck. We can't really help it. We can't do much. But you have also the GPS helps localizing your, identifying your actual positioning. The uh, um, LIDAR, it gets you some reference objects around you also by this 360 uh, degree th uh, a view of, of the LiDAR. So it will tell you what are the objects around you and whether you are aligned with them accurately or not. Uh, and with the, with the camera itself, it will also help. So maybe I see that, you know, uh, building ahead of me with, through, with that camera. And the LiDAR sees it a little bit shifted. And the IMU, because of the metals, is going to kind of impact a little bit and it's giving you uh, wrong uh, output about how the car is aligned or how the car is oriented. Through all of these together, they are fused with each other to identify as accurately as possible. Of course, errors could be still there as accurately as possible where the car is located, how the car is oriented, what are the objects around me and so on and so forth. So it's not just the IMU, it's not just the GPS, it's not just the LiDAR, it's everything together. The, the data is fused to as accurately again as possible, identify how the car is oriented and mitigate all of these impacts coming from metals around you, impacts coming from the weather conditions and so forth, so that you can uh, um, have this car operate as safely as possible and as accurately uh, as possible. All right. I think that's all of the questions. So thank you everyone for coming and thank you to Professor Osman for doing this wonderful presentation. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone. We're gonna end the broadcast now. Bye. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you for the invite. Thanks everyone.